Well, it's certainly good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning to worship him. Good to have each one that's come in our presence today. Let's begin our service by turning to hymn number 561. 561, and for those that can and will, please stand with us as we sing together. It is no secret what God can do. <clears throat> The chimes of time ring out the news another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened. standing for the invocation. <coughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning just thanking you for life and thanking you, Lord, for the beauty that you shared that we might enjoy. Father, we come this morning just praying for our church family and each and every one, Lord, that is sick or has a problem, we just do pray that you'll be with them and lift them up, Father, as you and you alone can do. Father, we come praying for all of our people that is in harm's way and for people that is in Florida that has lost everything that they own. It's such a sorrowful and pitiful time. But, Father, we just do pray that you'll just touch their hearts and let them know that you were always there and we should turn our mind and our hearts over to you and he'll take care of us. Now, oh God, we just thank you for each home who's represented here this morning and we just do pray, Father, that each and every one of us will leave this place knowing that it was good to be in your presence. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Amen. I'm glad you're here too. Good to see your smiling faces this morning as we celebrate 10 years of ministry together uh, on this beautiful day. I trust that you've come this morning to add to the service and your being here certainly is adding to the service. And we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth today as we have this service. 
enjoy the choir now as they're going to come and sing, I'm free. Now let's open our hymnals to number 344 as we stand and sing together the family of God. For all those that can and will, please stand with us as we sing. 344, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will a brother and sister around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so near when one has a heartache we all share the tears and rejoice in its victory in this family so dear I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood join us with Jesus as we travel this sod for I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From the weak. 
strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. May be seated. part of the family of God. Amen. Glad to see the family of God gathered together in this place this morning as many other family groups are gathering all across the nation, all across the world to worship the Lord this morning. Let's worship the Lord with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Brothers, would you come? Brother Harry, ask the blessing on it. This time I'm going to ask Brother Harry and Sister Becky to come and honor the Lord with a song.
I'm so glad that God likes to fellowship with us, and we like to fellowship with him, and we serve him by serving others. Thank you, Sister Becky and Brother Harry. We were talking the other day about a song, and Deborah sings it, and it's been a long time she sang it. So Sister Deborah's going to come and sing, When I Met the Master. Today is a day of celebration. Also, it's a little bit sad to some of us today. But today is our 10th anniversary of the church being here with Sandy and myself and celebrating the victories of God over the years and seeing what God has done. And God has certainly blessed our church. It seems like the last couple of years, there's been a lot of illnesses and a lot of sickness in, in, in people's lives. but. God's still here, and God's still on the throne, and we're still trusting in him. And I had thoughts of not having the service today, just go ahead and forego an anniversary service, but 
it seemed as if the Holy Spirit was saying, it's not just about you, Stanley. It's about the church. Well, you're my family. You're my church family. I'm delighted to have my physical family, my blood family here today. And uh, we're going to hear from Michael in just a little while. But, uh, but it's too important a time in the life of the church not to celebrate and not to uh, give God praise and glory for what he has done and what he's going to do. I want to just read just a couple of verses of Scripture, and then Brother Jack's going to come. Out of Hebrews chapter 11, God's hall of faith. Now, the faith. now, the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not seen. By it, the elders retain a good report. We could go on through this text and read of Abel and Cain and, and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and many of the other people that's listed here in God's hall of fame. God's Hall of Faith, and, and give you much of their life, and we won't take time to do that today, but I was reading some works of W.A. Tozer the other week, and W.A. Tozer takes a little bit different look at chapter 11 than what maybe we have in the past, and I liked what he said. You see, several times he says, by faith, for by faith, the elders obtained a good report through faith. By faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, and Sarah, and, and all the others, by faith. W.A. Tozer said that we need to change those words from through and by to in faith. And I sort of believe that might be true because if you look at verse 13, it says these all died, what? Not by faith, but in faith. Folks, you have to be in faith before you can live in faith and live by faith. And we know that the just shall live by faith because they, they have faith in God. They have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Sandy and I decided to come, I had a hard time making up my mind. Sandy didn't. She said, Stanley, this is where God wants you to, uh, want us to be and this is where we're going to go. I said, thank you. You made up my mind. But her and God helped me make up my mind. It was the greatest decision, seriously, the greatest decision outside of marrying Sandy and having a family is coming to this church and adopting, being adopted by a new family. And y'all take so good care of me, and y'all you know, have, and I'm sure you're going to continue to, but you love that you show us and, and what you've done for us. But this is a celebration for you as well as for me. And I thank God, let me just say this, I thank God for a church that cares about its pastor. And y'all do. In more ways than one, multiple ways you show your love. And a lot of it is by going out and visiting other folks and telling people what Jesus is doing and sharing the gospel and, and uh, growing in faith yourself. This has been a great 10 years and it just seems like it was yesterday. It really does. It seems like it was yesterday that... Uh, I met downstairs in the library with the, with the uh, council who was, interviewed me and talked to me about what, what I believed and what the, my plans were and what I looked forward to. And, and I just look forward to staying here until Jesus comes and preaching the gospel. Same thing then as now. And uh, seeing grow. A lot of you folks were not here 10 years ago uh, when, when Sandy and I came, but you're here, and if, if you was here last week, we consider you part of the family. It doesn't matter whether it's one day or one year or ten years or whatever. You're part of the family of God, and we thank you for being here. Thank you for your love and your goodness. But in homecoming every year, we put a little article in the, in the uh, bulletin that Jean, Jean, uh, Sister Jean does concerning the history of the church, but I wanted to do a little bit different this morning. I wanted us to go back and give the origin of this church and the origin of, of this family of God that God has put together. And I'm going to ask Brother Jack in a moment to do that. And then Mike's going to come and give us a look at the Waddell ministry, at the God that has used us to be involved in. And I don't have no idea what he's going to say. Just don't embarrass me. Because <laughs> 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 he wouldn't do that. But anyhow, it's, it's, it's great. To have a church family. It's great to have such a family of God that loves you and cares for you, and uh, God has done that over the 10 years that we're here. But uh, 
I look forward to serving God until God calls me home. And uh, maybe he should call us all home together in a rapture. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But as I thought about today's service, and it's just not about us, me, and it's not just about you, but it's about those who went before us, those who prepared the way. You see, God thought enough of all these people that he's mentioned in chapter 11 that he put a special book, a special chapter, used the writer of Hebrews to put a special chapter in here about them and their faith in God. You see, this church has a, a long history, a great memories from, from the past, and we have, we have been a church of, of standard and uh, a standard-bearing church for, for Christ. And as I looked at Brother Weaver's pictures, and I knew him as a kid, when I was a kid, I always had this thought, from the first time I ever remember seeing him, he's a statesman for the faith. Not a politician, but a statesman for the faith. He lived in faith. And he and Sister Weaver died in faith. He went on home to be with the Lord, serve him in heaven. And I think Sandy, would, we could say the same thing about her. She's not here today, but she's more alive than we are. She's more alive than, than, uh, than she's ever been. But she died in faith. I want to encourage you this morning to live in faith so that when it comes your time to leave this world, to depart to this place, it can be said of you that they not only lived in faith, but they died in faith. This morning is a time of honoring the past and looking forward to the future. I'm on, we're going to honor Brother and Sister Weaver and their history, and then we're going to look at today, and we're going to honor God as we do all of this, read his glory for his honor. You see, because we're just workmanship. We're just workmen that he uses and works through our lives. We really don't do anything. It's him that does it. But uh, he needs us to, to be workers in his field, workers in his, in his vineyard. And he tells us that it, in many places in the scripture. Brother Jack, how about you coming and giving us a little history and a little precepts of, of, uh, of the weavers and the ministry? And I'm going to sit down there so I can hear you. <laughs> I appreciate the help of Pat and Jean for this history. Nobody knows the history any better than they, the members of the Weaver family. This is a little bit of the history of their life, not by far their whole life history. So many things that we could tell you about brother and sister Weaver as the founding uh, family of our church. Brother Ralph was born November the 10th, 1915. Sister Minnie was born November the 8th, 1914. They were married. Ralph worked at Fieldcrest Mill. His job turned into a second shift job, and he quit because he could not attend Wednesday night services. That's the reason he left his job at Fieldcrest Mills. After that, he was a private contractor. He did many years uh, in the painting and hanging of wallpaper in Martinsville in Henry County. Kenneth's son was born on June the 3rd, 1934. Ralph and Minnie were, at that time, 19 years old. Jean was born November the 9th, 1938. Sorry about that. The day between her father and her mother's birthday. They were then Ralph and Minnie was 23 years old. And Ralph had asked the doctor to let her be born on, her, on his birthday, which was on the 10th of November. But Minnie said, no, she'll be born on the 8th, which is my birthday. So the doctor said, no, she'll be born in the middle on the 9th. 
and that's when she was born. Pat was born on May the 1st, 1941, when Ralph and Minnie was 26 years old. That's the immediate Weaver family. Ralph and Minnie were active in the Cola Baptist Church. Some of you folks are old enough to remember the Cola Baptist Church. When Ralph was 33 years old in 1948, he became pastor of the Hilltop Baptist Church in Martinsville, Virginia, on Hookabasset Hill, Red Oak Street. If you know where that is, it's directly across from where the Martinsville Hospital and High School is built now. They were all so excited and and they loved having their own church. The building was only a sanctuary. It was built on a slanting hillside. The front was level, but the sides and the rear was had to be put on tall constructed pillars to hold up the church. The first Sunday in the church, they went under the building and laid boards on buckets, and Sister Weaver and Margaret Turner taught Sunday school underneath the church. They very soon began digging out the basement and made comfortable Sunday school classrooms. The church grew quickly and began to run out of room. The church was well known throughout the community. Eleven years later, in 1956, we purchased the land where the church, Woodland Heights Rural Baptist Church, is now located. In 1959, we moved into the new church and named it Woodland Heights Baptist Church. It was very active and soon grew over 100 after its opening. Soon we learned about Free Will Baptists and decided to join because we had so many children in our church and felt it would be beneficial for them to go to summer church camps, quarterly district meetings, with training and fun for the children. The state conferences were open to the whole family. We would all go and stay in hotels. They had meetings for the children and they would participate in Bible memorization, art, singing, and so forth and they were rewarded at the Friday night dinner meeting of the state meeting. In time, Ralph became moderator and treasurer of the Central Virginia Quarterly Conference. He was pastor of Hilltop and Woodland Heights for 44 years until his death on October the 21st. 19 and 92. Sister Weaver, his beloved wife, passed away on November the 20th of 2011. We still have a few members from the Hilltop Church and the Woodland Heights Church today. Lewis Reeves, grew up in the church with his family. Lewis is with us today. Lucille Weaver met Kenneth and they were married. She grew up in the church, she's with us today. And of course, in 1950, I started going to the church. In 1951, 1950, we moved into the community. And there I met Jean and we were married in 1958. 
the names that I called out, there may be a couple more in the church in our presence today that remembers being members of the Hilltop Baptist Church. Georgia, was you? You were not, okay. I wasn't sure. But that is the current history. If you were with us on uh, when we celebrated our 77th anniversary here at the church. I have a little more information concerning the beginning of the Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church. The Woodland Heights Free Will Baptist Church, formerly Hilltop Baptist Church, was organized in 1942. It was located on Hookabasset Hill in Martinsville, Virginia, and the Reverend P.W. Emerson was the pastor. In February 1943, a dwelling house was located on a corner lot on Red Oak Street and was purchased for the mammoth sum of $1,100. That don't sound mammoth now, but it was back then. In the spring of 1947, grading work was begun on the same track of land to erect a new frame church building. In 1948, Reverend Ralph Lee Weaver was called to the church that had an active enrollment of 12 in Sunday school. For the next several years, the church grew and was decided that if this growth was to continue, a larger location would have to be secured. In 1956, our present location was decided upon and the lot was purchased. We had some people in the area that was not glad that we were gonna build a church here and tried every way they could to keep us from building a church on this lot, but God prevailed, amen. The building program was begun in 1959 that's the year that I was drafted in to service in the Army of the United States of America, which I'm glad. The first service was held on Sunday in the Sunday School Chapel in February of 1960. The building at that time consisted of a chapel with a seating capacity of approximately 125. It had an office, two restrooms, a hallway, a storage area, a furnace room, and seven Sunday school classrooms. During the next year, we purchased a tract of land adjoining our present property, which gave us at that time more than one acre of land. That summer, we expanded the parking area and built a picnic shelter. This shelter later became a fellowship building, and it's now known as our prophet's quarters. And we're still working on it. <laughs> uh, in the process of putting a new floor into our prophet's quarters. Should be finished this week, God willing. In 1965, we began construction of the sanctuary with beautiful stained glass windows, baptismal pool, natural furnished wood furniture, large hanging chandeliers, a nursery, a sound room, and an office. And the first service in this sanctuary was in 1966. In 1983, the note burning and cornerstone laying ceremony was held. If you go outside as you go down the steps, you notice our cornerstone is there on the left as you go out to the parking lot. We later built the new fellowship hall that adjoins the sanctuary by a connecting hallway. 
It consists of modern kitchen, two restrooms, a large dining area. In 2012, the Fellowship Hall was named the Ralph and Minnie Weaver Fellowship Hall. We also converted the former picnic shelter into what is now known as the Prophet's Quarters, which consists of a large living room, a dining area, a bedroom, a large bath, and two large closets. We later purchased 14 additional plats of land beside our parking area for future growth. So from this point to the trees on the far left, as you go out the door, we own all those lots. God bless us. They have plenty of room for growth, and we hope to use every one of them in the very near future. Reverend Weaver remained pastor until his death on the 21st of October in 92. The pastors that have served since his death, Reverend Clayton Cordell, Reverend Jay Summerlin, Reverend Terry Hardison, and of course our present pastor, Reverend Stanley Wardell, became pastor on the first Sunday in November in 2009. And nine, God has truly blessed us with good leadership. We thank God for our pastors. Some of the things that our church is active in in our community, we love our neighbors. You probably saw that on the sign as you come in. We have two clothes giveaways a year, spring and fall. We just went through one, which we blessed a number of folks with clothes. You just couldn't believe how many clothes that went out of that fellowship hall for people that needed clothing. God has blessed us to do that twice a year. We continue to do that. We have community visits that we take out gospel messages and invitations to our neighborhood. We have a television and an internet ministry that the Lord has blessed us with. And we have so many folks in our neighborhood that we come in contact with that I'm sure has talked to our membership and thanked them for our television ministry. Our pastor has several stories he's told us concerning people that watch our ministry on television and channel 18 right now <clears throat> at, on Sunday night at nine o'clock. After 77 years of ministry, we're growing strong and by God's grace, we will continue to desire to see souls saved, families restored, and the gospel go further than we have seen it before. We want to continue to be a lighthouse on the hill and trust and thank all of you for your support and your prayers as we look future to great things that the Lord is going to do for us. God bless you. Jack gave you a look of the past and a look at the current things that we're doing here in the church and working in our community. Let me say, I've had a long history over just, not just 10 years, but I've known Brother Jack about all my life and the, the Weaver family about all my life. We both came out of the same church, Cola Baptist Church, uh, and uh, he, he much, much before me, but uh, I'm just thrilled at what God has done and what he's doing and what he's uh, using us to do here together in uh, the last 10 years. I'm delighted, thrilled to have Michael and his family and Sandy's sister, Linda, with us this morning. Mike, you come up and uh, do what God wants you to do. Y'all stand up. I want, my, I want people here to see my family. Stand up. Thank you, Sam. Love you, Dad. Mm -hmm. All right. So I do not have a detailed uh, history.
history of my father and mom um, because I don't work that way. Um, Anything detailed in my life, Katie has done for me. Um, But I will quickly uh, go through um, what I remember. And, um, and then I want to share a few words from Scripture with you this morning. Dad told me that uh, I had to include Scripture and make this part of the sermon. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm excited to do that. But, uh, you know, I do not remember a time in my life that I wasn't a preacher's kid. Right? Um, I know there was a time because Dad didn't uh, submit to the call Um, until I was young, but uh, the first memory that I truly have of church um, was a Sunday night. We always went, I mean, we went, I I had a drug problem growing up. Um, I got drugged to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, whether I wanted to go or not. Um, That was a joke. Y'all are supposed to laugh at that. Thank you. This goes a lot better if you laugh at my jokes. Um, But there was a Sunday night, and Mom and Dad said that I was not going to church because it was going to be a long service. And I was like, they're all long. Um, But I stayed with my grandparents, and um, there was something happening that night called a deacon's ordination, and they just felt it was going to go really, really long. And so I stayed with my grandparents and um, watched Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Um, and about the time that was over, um, they pulled in, and all of a sudden, my dad was a deacon. I thought it was probably some kind of um, private ceremony in cloaks and robes and, you know, a knight's sword, all of that kind of stuff. I later found out that that's not the case, and it really made it a lot more boring. Um, but originally, I thought it was awesome that they were having this secret service for him. And then occasionally, my dad would, uh, would preach when um, the pastor was gone. It was then the, uh, the Gospel Tabernacle Baptist Church. I don't remember any of the Kohler Baptist stuff. I know that's where dad met mom um, and, and all of those pieces, but I couldn't remember that. I wasn't there. So I'm going to skip forward to uh, the 80s. So dad was a deacon, and then um, he submitted to the call of the ministry, and served alongside uh, Charles Harrison um, at Mountain View for a number of years. Dad was the associate pastor in official and unofficial roles for many years. And then um, he got this harebrained idea that God wanted him to serve churches that were hurting um, in the role of interim ministry. Um, Probably the hardest thing that a person can do in ministry, in my personal opinion is to step into a church that has recently been broken and try to walk with them through the healing process. And then when it's time to rejoice and celebrate with them, you leave. Um, I, I have an immense amount of respect for what dad and mom did during those years. Um, and they, dad, I'm sure these are in the wrong order and I don't have them all listed, but, um, dad served Mount Hermon church of the brethren for, almost two years, am I correct? And from there, you know, it, we would go to Mountain View on Sunday mornings, and then Sunday nights and Wednesdays, we'd go with Dad to wherever he was. So he served Mount Hermon for uh, almost two years. Um, then he took a role serving uh, Druid Hills Baptist Church for a, a long, long time. He served Greenwood Baptist Church um, down in Axton. Um, and quite honestly, the list is, is really, really long. So we're just going to put all the others in the other category um, because he and mom served relentlessly for 20, 25 years in the role of interim ministry. And through that time, and, and I'll, I'll speak of this in just a minute, um, mom was by dad's side the entire time. It was, if you think for one minute that dad could be where he is today without my mom's prayers and my mom's urging and and my mom standing behind him, um, you are sadly mistaken. Um, While for for everything that mom wasn't publicly, she was privately. She didn't, she never wanted to be right here. It probably bugged her to be on TV in the choir, Um, but Privately, she was the backbone of my dad's ministry. And um, 10 years ago, Katie and I had just moved home from, from California. 
And uh, I guess it was 11 years ago we moved home. And dad, and dad, dad told me, he's like, hey, I, I think God's moving us this direction. And, you know, I knew nothing about you guys, to be fair. I, I had no idea who you were. Um, I knew who Jack was because of West Window. <laughs> um, but we prayed with mom and dad and were very excited when, when they accepted the, the, the call of God to come and pastor this church. And one of the things that I have always appreciated about my father is the simple fact that he's never let being a pastor go to his head. And he's got a big head. Um, but he never allowed his position or his office to cloud his mind as to what was really the most important piece of the calling, and that is to take the gospel to anyone and everyone that would listen. Dad and I don't always agree on how to get that done, but I do always agree with him that that is what has, ur- that, 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 that is what has pushed him, that is what has fueled him throughout all of these years. I am beyond blessed that I don't have the pastor kid syndrome because I had a dad who and a mom who kept things real at all times. It was never about looking for the next big church or the next big opportunity. It was never about writing books and having fame. It was never about pastor worship. Um, It's always been simply about who is God calling me to minister to now and what is it that they need and how can we take them from where they are to a place where they too are ministers of the gospel in their community. And I think you would all agree with me that probably one of the the key components um, of dad and mom's ministry has always been helping people realize that the office of pastor is not the office of do everything. It's the office of of teaching people that every member is a minister. I can't tell you how many times dad has gone to people, and I'm sure you've heard this if you've been around more than five minutes. You take an idea to him, and he'll simply go, that's great, go do it, right? I, I, I have inherited that from him in the sense that If a church is to do what God has called it to do, every member must be active in ministry. There is no room for a hierarchical approach of elevating the pastor and his family above everyone else. And the beauty of my dad's ministry is he's never allowed that, that I know of, and I'll stand here and, and, and testify to the fact that who you see in this pulpit on Sundays is the same nut job you see on Mondays at home. That was a joke. Dad laughed. Thank you all. But I am, I am humbled to say that I am the son of what I believe are two of the greatest ministers that have ever walked the face of the earth. While we have disagreed on methodology and how to dress for church, (laughs) I have never once doubted the sincerity of my dad's calling, of my mom's calling. I have never once questioned their faith. I have never once questioned the reality that he knows without a shadow of a doubt that he is supposed to take the gospel to anyone and everyone who will listen. And that got me thinking a little bit about what this whole thing of ministry is all about. And over the last 10 years, as Dad has served in more or less a full-time role as pastor, he's taught me some things without knowing that he's taught me some things. And you as a church have taught me a lot without me ever, I was talking to Gabe on the way over, I think this is actually the first Sunday morning that I've ever spent with you guys. 
I'm pretty sure. I've done Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. So without me ever being here for a full worship service, I've watched how you have loved on my mom and my dad, and I've learned a lot about what being a minister of the gospel is. So y'all are okay if we go like five, ten minutes late, right? Good. I was telling Nelson beforehand, our, my church starts at 1030. That's why you see us leaving the restaurant when y'all are getting there. But the food's already here, so nobody's going to steal it from you. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to go through a lot of scripture really quick. But Matthew 16, 26 says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his souls? Ministers of the gospel are sometimes forgotten by the very fact that they're ministers. I love the history of this church today because it, it serves us more than just simply knowing dates and facts. It, it takes us back to real people in a real time so that we can see the real sacrifice that was made for the gospel to go forth. Ministers are often passed over for recognition because truly they have an indifference for the material cares of the world. They're, they're marked as strange for their untiring dedication to the truth of the word of God. Men and women across this world receive honor for sports, for literature, for science, for medicine. But very few give honors to those who take the gospel to the least of these. Many believe that a minister and his family have everything that they could ever want simply because they submitted to service of preaching the word. Sadly, that's not true. Preachers and their families often endure hardships just as those who have gone before them did. They ask nothing, but in many cases they literally give everything. They go into harm's way to deliver the message of salvation to all who will believe. They have tears of joy for those who are saved, and they have tears of loss for those who reject the truth. Most times a thankless task do they perform, seeking only to serve the will of God and to introduce lost souls to the truth. The beauty of this is that their thanks and their reward they know is not on this earth, but it is in a country that exists somewhere else in time and space. Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house, what is his reward then? 1 Corinthians 9 actually answers that says, what is my reward? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, giving freely what he has received freely, that I abuse not my power in the gospel, taking no thought for power as not being Lord over his flock, but as an example to them. So who is a minister of the gospel? We've, I think over the last... 77 years of this church, you have realized that a minister of the gospel is anyone who has heard and has submitted to the gospel. You have exuded that to this community time and time again. But I want to take it a step further and give you just a couple of things that my dad and my mom have taught me. A minister of the gospel is someone who installs great encouragement and insight. A minister of the gospel is someone who excites duty among those that will listen and believe the gospel. A minister of the gospel is someone who gives of themselves, someone who gives hope, comfort, and joy when it can't be found anywhere else. A minister of the gospel is someone who is a director of the course, who leads by example. A minister of the gospel is someone who endures hardships and is a fighter of the enemies of the cross. 
When everyone else is tired and ready to go home, they stay on their knees until the battle has been won. A minister of the gospel is a watcher of his own soul. Lest by any means he himself who has preached to others should miss the crown that he is working so hard. He cares for his soul because most often there's not a lot of other people caring for it for him. A minister of the gospel is someone who does not allow their calling to deter from their humbleness and the realization that they are but a tool in the tool shed of the gospel. A minister of the gospel is someone who lives what they preach, not as some hypocrites do in teaching one thing and doing another, but someone who actually lives out the words that come out of their mouth. A minister of the gospel is someone who believes that gain of worldly possession are but a loss if he loses sight of the cross. A minister of the gospel is someone who has forsaken all For the glory of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to every ear that needs to hear it. Nothing else matters. And a minister of the gospel is someone who realizes that they can do nothing on their own. And so they submit to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in them to move and guide and direct their steps. Philippians 3, 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss for Christ. Philippians 1, 20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful to you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your furtherance and joy in the faith, that your rejoicing may be abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. A minister of the gospel forsakes all worldly gain so that someone else may know eternal gain and glory. Dad already alluded to Hebrews 11, but I'll close with it as well. This is where mom is. This is where Mr. and Mrs. Weaver are. And if you know my dad, he's gonna, he probably prays that he dies in this pulpit. And he's going to have his notes up here, and he's going to expect one of you to come and finish the sermon before you call the ambulance. Am I right? Yeah. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. It is the duty of Christians to be ministers so that they may close, closely and unequivoc- unequivocally understand that the cause is not theirs. My dad has, for the better part of my life, lived an example that said, you can listen to me and you can watch me, 
and you're going to see the same thing. And what I have seen is that my dad does not deserve, or or not deserve, does not desire any glory here on earth, but that his chase is for the eternal glory of a great and awesome God. He has no desire for gold or silver, nor for the praise of men. But just as on August 10th, I believe my mom heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I believe that that is my dad's dream, not just for himself, but for each and every one of you. So we're here to celebrate and not to mourn, but I could not close this service without simply saying these things. Do we mourn for those who have ministered among us and are no longer with us? The answer is a resounding yes. We absolutely mourn. Do we miss them when they are gone? Absolutely. Not just because of what they built, but what they, they, they did in our internal lives, what, what they meant to us. Absolutely, we mourn for them. We miss them. And we never forget who they were. We honor them with our words. We honor them with our actions. But how do we remember them? A lot would say that we honor them by remembering what they did. That they love the work of the Lord. That they love to feed the sick. That they love to help the poor, the hungry, the naked, the lost. If you truly want to honor these men and women who have gone before you, may I suggest to you today that we don't simply talk about them, that we don't simply celebrate them, but we get off of our rear ends and we go into the world that they love so much and we carry on the work that they started. That we do not miss opportunities to tell those that we love who Jesus is. That we don't miss opportunities to take the gospel to those who may never hear it. My prayer for each and every one of us today is not simply that we remember or that we never forget but is that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to each and every one of our hearts each day of this life as we move forward and place people in front of us that we are called to minister to ourselves. Our job as Christians is not to come and sit in Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services and learn about the gospel. Our job is to hear the gospel, receive the gospel, and freely give it away just as it was freely given to us. Do you want to honor honor those who have ministered to you? Then go minister to someone else. There is no other way to do it. We, there, there's no expir, uh, uh, expiration date on your usefulness. I don't care when you retired, you did not retire from the ministry of the gospel. Do you want to ra- waste your life? Retire from ministering the gospel. You want to live your life so that when you walk into the presence of Jesus, he says, well done, get to work. Never tire. Get on your knees. Read the word. Love the unlovable. Teach the unteachable. Minister to those who don't look like you, smell like you, act like you. Love them. Love them all the way to the cross. And for lack of a better term, and I'm probably going to get some cross eyes on this, love the hell out of them. Because without the love of the gospel, that's where they're going. I love you guys. Thank you for loving my mama. Thank you for loving my daddy. But more than that, thank you for loving those who without you would not have an eternity with him. 
Amen. One of these days you might become a great preacher. Yeah, right. I'm good. Uh, what a joy it is to have Michael to, uh, to be here this morning. I had the privilege of pastoring Sister Weaver for a couple of years. Never will forget. First thing she said on that Sunday morning, she sat right there, I think, on the second row. She says, Preacher, I can't do much, but I promise you one thing, I'll pray for you every day. And she did. Brother Ken, he prayed for me every day. Now Lucille's doing it. Sandy, without a doubt, prayed for me every day. I need prayer warriors, folks. Just keep lifting me up to heaven. I want to ask the members of the Weaver family and my family, the Waddell family, to come forward. Nelson. Weaver family, if you will, because of where the pictures are. Just put them over here on this side. As we honor Brother and Sister Weaver, as we did 10 years ago or eight years ago with the Weaver Fellowship Hall, we want to honor them today. If I had, if, if I had to ask today Sandy and Mr. and Ms. Weaver's permission to do what I'm about to do, they would have said no. But church, you have been so gracious to us and so good to us that I think, as the Word of God says, that they not only lived in faith, but they died in faith. We honor them and their, the work that they have done and all that they've done for God's glory. Nelson, stand right here, please. I'd like for you and Michael at this time to take the cover off of the pictures and for the families to look at them and then the church to look at them, and then Mike and Nelson is going to go hang these in the vestibule so that everybody can see when they come in. Thank God for saints of God who died in the faith. Jack, how about just thanking God for our history and for these dear loved ones that's now been in heaven? Yes. And enjoy eternity with him. Now, um, thank you for all that you're doing for our church, for the movement that we see in our midst. And we pray, Lord, that you would revive each of our hearts and each of our members, Lord, that we might have the same desire that those that have gone before us had to see many souls won to the Lord. May this church be a light.
Amen. Mike and Nelson, would you just carry those to the back and, and hang them in the vestibule? The hook's are already there. And everybody else could be seated for just a moment. Y'all might want to hold them where people can see them as you go down the aisle. I, just, I laid them there so they can pick them up. Thank you for being here. Lunch will be some, some quick lunch out in the uh, fellowship hall. Finger sandwiches and things of that nature. I don't know what all they've got, but anyway, if you're a Baptist or a Methodist or Presbyterian or whatever, I know you like to eat, so just go out with us and have a, have a meal. Let me say thanks to this church again for 10 wonderful years. Y'all have blessed my heart. And you've blessed Sandy so so graciously, and uh, just uh, just keep praying that God would continue to use us. And in the in the using of us, I mean it's all of us, all of us. And we need your regular attendance. We need you working for God's glory. Uh, we'll be no service tonight uh, here at the church, but we we'll, we'll be back Wednesday night for a prayer meeting at seven, seven o'clock. Also, it wasn't in your bulletin this morning because. Uh, we just didn't do it. We didn't have time to. But uh, just this genius fixed our yearly hanging of the green forms. Uh, they will be six dollars each this year. And you know how we do it. If you do to do it in honor or memory of of uh, one or ten family members, however you want, then pick up your your form down here on the on the uh, offering table on on the uh, Lord's table. So. Uh, and, and take them with you and, and just get them back to Sister Jean uh, as soon as possible so we can order. Huh? By November 15th. Okay, we need to order them by then. But it's been great being in God's house. I love to hear the, the history. Hey, folks, we heard what was past. We heard what we're doing now. And we've been encouraged to go harder and greater and further and do more than we've ever before. I'm ready to lead the army of God if we just go marching through this community, Amen. telling others about Jesus, seeing souls saved, seeing some people come to know Christ. Anything else? Brother Jack, would you just dismiss however you see fit, and then we'll go over and have a bite to eat. <laughs>